that he left here. Um, so uh, Patrick also is in the process of putting a book together, a monograph and biography of James Ware, and it's um, projected to be. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I've been saying that uh, since about this year, but I've been saying that for the last four years. But so that's okay. We're trying to make it happen. Soon enough, <laughs> soon enough I'm going to make a liar out of myself. Just, much longer. just get it down on paper and it's fine. Anyway. Um, but it'll be a definitive uh, you know, work of James Ware. And uh, I don't think, you know, in general, that we know that much about him here, perhaps, to hear his name. But you'll see tonight how many buildings right within the village of Barbara he's had uh, his hands on. So it's really great. So we welcome Patrick, and I'm sure you'll enjoy his talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as Allison said, James Ware was an architect, uh, very well known in New York City, 1800s. He was born in 1846 and worked until 1918. Um, actually retired in 1914 or so, um, and lived till 1918. Um, and his sons also became quite well recognized architects in their own right, joining his firm at about 1900 or so. And uh, they gradually transitioned the business to them. But in the 1870s, when James Ware began, he was uh, very well known as a designer of brownstones and row houses in New York, mostly luxurious. Um, and by about 1878, he devised these houses here in East 67th Street. Uh, these are considered the very, or the only second Queen Anne style houses anywhere in New York. Where was only the third architect in America to work in the very popular Queen Anne style, and only the second in New York to do so. And the Queen Anne is typified by um, a mixture of materials, a combination of um, wood, terracotta, stone, masonry. Um, it includes half timbering, irregular roof lines, very prominent gables, and um, is considered pretty much what we consider to be Victorian architecture today, what you consider Victorian at large. Uh, it's typified by the Queen Anne style. Where was uh, Sort of his work in New York and mostly here in Millbrook and elsewhere is uh, emblematic of a Queen Anne style, which was English derived. It became madly popular through America from about 1880 right through the early part of the 1900s. Uh, he was trained in the French style of architecture, Beaux Arts, what we call the Beaux Arts French style, and uh, Second Empire Baroque. But uh, as he uh, progressed in throughout New York, the English style became pretty much his forte. So we see here, this is what is called a barbell tenement. So in addition to being involved in architecture at the very high end of the spectrum for you know, luxury, apartment, luxury row houses, etc., he also was involved in what they call remedial architecture, designing buildings to increase the uh, livability of tenements in the city. And you had um, a lot of buildings that would have uh, room after room after room with no windows, no ventilation, no lighting, and the sort of unfavorable conditions that were described in the uh, exposés by Jacob Rees. And uh, in 1879, there was a uh, competition to design what they call a model tenement. And James Ware won the tenement uh, competition in 1879 and became sort of very well known as the world's premier designer of model tenements. And this was called the dumbbell, and what it did is, if you see these buildings si built side by side, there's a sort of indentation that he would put in the building, and that's why they called it the barbell or the dumbbell, is because of its, its shape. What would happen is when these buildings are built side by side, the space between them there would then be doubled, which could be used as a light port, which would increase light and air into parts of the building that were previously unavailable before. Um, but like most innovators, his Remedy was viewed soon as not good enough. What happened is, in a lot of cases, the air shafts themselves were fairly small, often filled up with trash. They didn't really allow that much air and light in, and in the event of a fire, they had a very, very dangerous flu effect. So although he was considered a uh, pioneer for uh, his development of the Nobel, 
the barbell rather, it soon became pejoratively known as the dumbbell. Whereas other critics, other architects would sort of criticize it. Um, but again, it was just sort of a starting point in architecture to determine what social responsibility architects have to, uh, to the city and in urban planning. But in the um, late 1870s, it was, no, it was not yet sort of decried. It was actually uh, quite a victory for him. And in many ways, uh, I like to say in the book, it was no weight for the architect to bear, but instead was like a key that opened the city of New York for James Ware itself at the dawn of the Gilded Age. He uh, used his wide acclaim from the model tenements for the rest of his life uh, as a form of social philanthropy. Uh, he was very engaged in social reform and an ardent Presbyterian, as were his sons who continued in that tradition. Uh, again, so most, mostly these days, Ware is remembered mostly for what they call the dumbbell, unfortunately. <laughs> This is a uh, Fifth Avenue mansion, actually two mansions in one. You have one here and one there, for a gentleman named Andrew Judson White, very colorful character from the Gilded Age. This is on the corner of Fifth Avenue and I believe 66th Street, um, or at least it was, it was torn down 30 years later. Most Fifth Avenue, Fifth Avenue mansions didn't really have that long of a lifespan. He was on the same block as John Jacob Astor, whose house I believe is right down here. This is more sort of like a French chateau style and introduces uh, where is what they call the Flemish gable, which became sort of a, a staple of his a sort of signature architectural component. And um, for a mansion like this to appear on Fifth Avenue was considered uh, a sign of having arrived as much for the architect as for his client. And um, again, it looks here, this photo itself may be from years later. It looks like some of the windows are fairly boarded up, and I think it wasn't long before uh, Judson was gone. Possibly sold it to someone else. Again, uh, yeah, these Fifth Avenue mansions, as glorious as they were, really had a very, very short uh, shelf life. This is the Osborne Apartments at uh, West 57th Street and I believe 7th Avenue. Um, and this was considered the very first skyscraper, technically. It's sort of an academic question to say, what is the first skyscraper? Uh, a lot of the criteria has to do with the use of masonry or steel skeletal structure. Um, but it's sort of an academic question. But the fact remains is that it was built in 1884, which was six months before any of Chicago's claimants to the title of uh, the world's first skyscraper. It was the tallest building in the world when it was built in 1884, and it set off a sort of uh, arms race of height that resulted in the development of the skyscraper as we know today. Um, this building is also the, uh, considered only the second luxury apartment building in New York after the Dakota. Um, it was built before the Dakota, but the Dakota was actually finished before it. So it's sort of a, a weird sort of uh, timeline there, but um, the fact remains, when it was built, it was determined to be the tallest building in the world. And they told people that they would consider building even a higher cupola, just to sort of maybe scare them into trying to not build higher than the other one. Um, but unlike Ware's uh, tenements designs, which were actually uh, resulted in laws being based upon their enactment, um, Osborne had another set of laws which was determined to not make buildings as high at all anymore. So the Daly Law, and this is the last very tall building built in New York before the Daly Law, which required more advances in skeletal steel. Um, the idea of a building of this, of this height in 1884, people were astonished that something that large wouldn't just simply collapse and fall down. So there was a real paranoia about tall buildings, and it was sort of uh, set off by James E. Ware. Uh, he doesn't really necessarily get much credit as the uh, designer of but I'm calling the world's first skyscraper. But if you read contemporary reports in the New York Times at the time, uh, they talk about it pretty much being um, this colossal wonder of the world that people were astonished that he was able to build it so high. Um, a lot of the reason that he didn't necessarily get credit for it is he was instantly eclipsed by other buildings that instantly started just building beyond and higher and taller. Again, sort of creating an arms race of height in New York and in beyond. The idea of the skyscraper is almost an academic question. Chicago versus New York. It's considered a New York idea that actually found its, um, 
it, it found its destiny in Chicago. So this sort of overturns a bit of orthodoxy about that. Um, if you click the next slide. And the reason we don't remember so much, well, let's see. No? Okay. It might be taking a while to learn this so. Okay, I think the technical aspects. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we can talk about this one all night, I suppose. <laughs> uh, is there a next one? Maybe. Um, it looks like it wants to load. Uh, Did he use steel structure for that one? Uh, it's determined now they're finding out that there was some steel structure in it, and that's why it's sort of changing the qualifications. The idea of the world's first skyscraper is based on the idea of the use of structure. What was the name of that? This is the Osborne Apartments. Oh, still there. Yes, yeah, still there, still there. Uh, so we're level probably number five. So we may have to go just to the that. And the uh, picture that's about to come up, or I hope comes up, uh, explains why in many ways that the Osborne was not really remembered as the tallest building in the world initially. A lot of it had to do with the fact of the Osborne Lobby, which is considered the most beautiful apartment lobby in all of New York. Sort of indisputed. Um, the picture comes up in a moment, we can sort of see here. Um, <laughs> but again, it was considered uh, the most beautiful lobby, one of the very first times when you had the leading art decorators of the day, such as Tiffany and um, a gentleman named Jacob Holzer and St. Augustus Gubbins and various sculptors who were famous as designers. It was the first time they actually collaborated with an architect. In, in that manner, and it became sort of a commonplace practice after that. So in many ways, the Osborne is sort of a, the bellwether for um, not just tall buildings, but luxurious apartment buildings as well. Did you say, is it still there? It is still there. Yeah. Yes, it's still there. It's diagonal from uh, across from Carnegie Hall, and became very, very popular with the uh, descendants of opera and music, oh, yeah. because the building itself supposedly is uh, completely soundproof. Although that's not entirely true if you talk to someone who lived there. Uh, at one point in the 1950s, someone complained about someone playing the same piano notes over and over and over again. And it turned out it was um, Leonard Bernstein writing West Side Story. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time your neighbors are making some noise musically, who knows? Maybe they're coming up with an American masterpiece. Party session. Anyways, I uh, took a bit of technical difficulty. I also just lost the projector, so we're back. Oh, okay. Did, did, did somebody step on the Oh, is it possible? Maybe we lost the power. I don't know. Check the card. It's still plugged in here. It's here. Check it as a projector. The Osborne Apartments is supposedly also haunted, which uh, befitting its status as a sort of uh, classic New York building. Supposedly there is a ghost who walks around and rattles the door handles of any unlocked door in the building. So this is sort of a, a night watch. And there were later additions to the building, designed by an architect who was the son of the original owner. And his ghost is sometimes, they said, seen in the elevator holding a watch fob looking very impatient. So, um, sort of befits its status as a sort of legendary name in the York building. I sent the book around. There's a picture of, of Ware's family that I'm sending around. People can sort of take a look at as they want. What's really nice about the photos of his family is a lot of photos you see in the 1800s of people Everyone is uh, usually frowning. You never see anyone smiling. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, they say, is because the exposure rate took so long that for someone to sit there and hold a smile for, say, a minute or two, they're sort of like, after a while, they're all sort of frowning. Thank you. The wonderful thing about all the Ware family photos is they all seem very happy, everyone's smiling, and it's very, uh, very, very cheerful. It's close to most of the photos we see of uh, people in the 1800s. Uh, let me see. Let me see how I can sort of things going naturally. Pick things up. <coughs> Some of the uh, pieces I have actual blueprints here. Um, the one here to the left would be the first uh, fireproof warehouse in the world. It's called the Manhattan Storage Warehouse. 
and it was um, advertised to be um, fireproof, waterproof, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They had a fire for two breakout in the first couple of years. The building operated exactly as advertised, and uh, having done so, then they um, did a sequel a few years later, which would be the more Italian style building about 10 blocks north of there. Both of those buildings have been torn down, the victims of progress in Midtown, I suppose. The very first one was done sort of in a French style, rounded towers, and the second one a bit more Italian. -y. They both share the exact same floor plan blueprint, though, which is astonishing considering the outside of the buildings both look both entirely so different. The first one, uh, the French one, was based on the Carcassonne Castle in France. And the second one is based on the town hall in Florence, called the Cafe uh, Palazzo Vecchio, or Vecchio, and that's sort of pronunciation. Um, so you saw where, you know, taking um, influence from European buildings and mixing it together with English styles and French styles, and sort of a salad of mixture of, uh, of different kinds of arch architectural components to sort of create sort of an American architecture. American architecture really didn't come into its own until, say, the 1800s or so. Up until then, people seemed like they were still very much enthralled with European models, especially French. Hmm. It'd be nice if you could see that lobby, because it's such a beautiful photo. <laughs> The photo I'm using, I'm not actually using the book. The ones I'm using the book, I actually had to have a license. The other one is super, super private. Very, very um, protective of the sort of jewel box world they have encased within. So I was very, very lucky to get in touch with a historian there who pretty much gave me everything I wanted for this book. So it'd be nice if you could see that from him, because it's really just beautiful, beautiful, astonishing use of uh, tile and uh, mosaics. Marble, just really, really wonderful. Anybody have any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> what I feel like I'm trying to smoke here. Twice rather than just once. Yeah, I know. And maybe double click, or if you want to maybe skip ahead, maybe maybe it just has a yeah. skipping over. Yeah. Maybe even. Sure, that's fine. That's fine. Whatever works. Okay, that's down a bit. Alright, so that would be the uh, regiment lobby. Regiment lobby. Regiment you want Osborne? Armory. Yeah, if you could do the Osborne lobby, I just think people should see it because it's such a wonderful photo. And this is a lobby with uh, twin doors, elevators on either side. The photo's not all that clear. But again, you can see the combination of uh, uh, foil back mosaics, gold leafing. Italian marble, inlaid floors, and sort of a seashell sort of look there. And the absolute fabulousness of the lobby is what was supposed to sort of pillow people's reservations about living in an apartment house. Up until then, apartments were considered almost like tenements. And no one wanted to live in a building, say, uh, a person of means wasn't going to live in a building in which they would have to climb more than two or three flights of stairs, for instance. So it was a development of elevator technology and fireproofing technology in whereas buildings such as his warehouses that actually allow the development of places like the Osborne and skyscrapers in general. Who built this first um, elevator? Um, I don't know if it was the Otis Elevator Company, but I know later he's involved with Otis Elevator. Otis. They seem to be the leader of the field. Because weren't they out at the Gibson? Um, I believe at, at one point they were. Yeah, because they've been all around, yeah. But um, he did... Um, Used the Otis Elevator Company for the uh, when he redid the Halcyon Hall into the Bennett College in 1907, and also in the um, Mohawk Mountain House, which we're also designed. The majority of he also used the Otis Company for the elevator stairs. Is it really? Oh wow! Yeah. Well, there were no more wide is sort of the progenitors of elevator technology. Yeah, yeah. Did you see that picture that was taken in the Bennett College? And this is the 12th Regiment Armory. 
This was at uh, Columbus Avenue and I believe 61st Street. It no longer exists, but it was the very first armory in New York. Uh, Ware himself did not serve in the Civil War. He was too young, but the Civil War draft riots in New York City broke out the day after his 17th birthday, and he was a member of the 7th Regiment National Guard. And it had a real impact on him for the rest of his life. They were very involved in militia causes, and um, he was very proud to have been the designer of New York's first armory. Uh, the, the level of disturbance typified by the Civil War draft riots was not expected, but class warfare was still alive and well, which provided that all the new armories would all be built north of Central Park, rather than sort of downtown, mm -hmm. where the initial problems had to be done. And you see sort of like paramilitary articulation, and almost a Scottish baronial kind of style. And he was applauded very much for the, uh, the layout of the building, which was on a very, very awkward L-shaped site. Hmm. So now we come to uh, Ware's work in Melbourne, which is what we're probably all interested in. This is Altamont, his very first uh, work in Millbrook, on the highest hill <coughs> in the village. And this is for uh, Henry J. Davison, senior. Um, and it's on a typical Queen Anne with towers and pinnacles and balustrades and that sort of thing. I believe this was a giant water tower. Hmm. And then this was sort of a uh, servant's wing, which I also believe contained a bowling alley. One of many that Ware designed in, Mil in, in Milburn. There's bowling alleys in lots and lots of these buildings. Uh, for the very first house in Milburn, it's, it's uh, sort of not entirely successful. It looks sort of like added on elements of just sort of thrown together, but it was a first, a first step. And this next, uh, uh, the next one coming up would be the Altamont Gatehouse. In general, a lot of uh, Ware's mansions were not necessarily as successful as his estate buildings, uh, such as this gatehouse right here, which has a little bit more resolved kind of influence to it. There's sort of a rounded tower here. It's a little difficult to see in this photo. When I was a child growing up, this building was covered in yellow stucco, and it resembled a sort of a giant sandcastle, which is one of the reasons I also sort of admired it. There's a little lagoon here to the left, and not far down, either there or just down beyond there, Davidson had a giant windmill, which looked um, almost as if it was about to take flight, the way the roofs were sort of I've only seen one or two photos of it, not, not, very, not very good. And the LA was designed by taking the main hands. Yeah, you can see a carriage sort of taking up, up the hill, as it were. And uh, Davison, uh, Davison and Ware uh, met in New York. Davison tried to convince uh, his friends and colleagues to come to Milbrook with him and to create mansions of their own, to create a sort of colony of, of hilltoppers here in Milbrook. Um, and so the next one, would be um, his neighbor right across the street, John D. Wing, who created San Denona. In many ways, though, Wing had a head start over Davidson because he had attended the Nine Partners uh, boarding school, the Quaker boarding school, and then came back and bought that building, and then had his friend Charles Tripp put the house on log rollers and had dozens of oxen move the house up the hill to where its current location was. Oh, it's fine Lord. Lord. And that's just above uh, what used to be the old high school. I guess it's probably now the middle school now. And so you can see sort of in the uh, roof line there, you can see sort of the original um, shape of the original school. But after he took it, expanded, put turrets, added towers, a bowling hat roof, etc., etc., mm -hmm. this is just sort of an uh, overload of Queen Anne Victoriana. And uh, he had 360 views from the tower. And uh, again, these uh, houses were not necessarily so successful aesthetically, but most of the estate outbuildings that surrounded them resulted in much better architecture. The Queen Anne is typified by sort of all these towers and pinnacles, etc. Um, but a lot of these houses were just continuously being rebuilt. <coughs> if a client had a whim, oh, we want a tower? Okay, well, he have to put a tower there. <laughs> if you didn't like it, they tear that down and put something else. So these houses were constantly being rebuilt. In Wing's case, uh, they said it was even more, because he was almost reliving a sense of his own youth. 
in the school that he had attended as a child. He saved the school bell and put it up here on the balcony. And now he was almost like living his youth, tearing down rooms, adding on a whim. And um, they said he kept some of, the, some of the rooms exactly as they were in the schoolhouse when he was a child. So there must have been some sense of nostalgia as well for the architect. Uh, this next one is fairly interesting. Um, it's the original version of Shadow Lodge on uh, Nine Partners Lane, which is one of the only houses still surviving from the original mm -hmm. Sandinon estate. Now this is how it originally appeared. You can see this is a front from Nine Partners right here looking directly at it. This is only half of the house. And there's a little tower there. So you can sort of see he began small. But you can see it's already the sort of the chalet effect. And if you go to the next slide, you can see how it's been expanded to the shadow lodge at the end today. It's still one of the most beautiful houses on that part of the planet. And there it is today. So you can see in the original, there was the original cottage right there, and they expanded it here with a big great room and that tower. And you see these sloping roofs here. And this was where his first use of the chalet style, which became almost a signature for him. And you can see him uh, you know, we use this in, in a lot of his other Milbrook houses in some form or another. You have the very, like, wide eaves, very long sloping roofs, and dormer windows. And um, I think it was a lot of it was by the time the 1880s came around, the English Queen Anne was sort of old hat to wear. It was still sort of new to everyone else, but having pioneered it, he was always looking for other ways to sort of change it up and influence it with other European styles. In this case, sort of German, Swiss, and sort of Middle European. And the final house we have here from the uh, San Donna estate is also the only other survivor, which would be the Wing Gate House, the San Donna Gate House, which um, is considered one of the most adored houses in Melbourne. Um, its absolute cuteness, though, sort of obscures the sort of devastating effectiveness of the combination of the Queen Anne with the chalet style. In many ways, this, this particular house was sort of an epiphany for wear. It was the first. Um, chalet building he designed from scratch that was not sort of an add-on to something else. And it sort of uh, was a little more architecturally resolved. You had sort of very uh, complex spatial relationships uh, and possibly delicate balcony up there. But it's sort of resolved and it's sort of uh, more feminine design than a lot of his other work. And um, again, it became sort of a, a, a paradigm, a, par a prototype for a lot of his other work that he would do. Is that Main Street to the left? Uh, that's Main Street. We'd be, we'd be driving along Main Street, and here's the front gate. The house has been added on to in the back. They've added on a whole new wing. Um, but wisely, they decided to keep the front facade and not change the actual view of the house. It was done by a local firm, I believe, Daniel Contelmo Architects. Mm -hmm. And I believe its restoration was, I was told, on a television show, America's, Building America's Great Dream Houses on the A&E Network. And they showed the whole renovation into, into the so he's to be applauded for sort of keeping the, the original style, and the addition that he placed on the back is almost an exact replica, including the same fish scale shingles, stonework, etc. One of the beautiful houses of Milbrook. Right. And we come now to the Milbrook Inn from 1890. And the idea of the Milbrook Inn was it was invested in by a lot of the hill, hilltoppers, Davidson. Dietrich, the Wings, as a way, uh, a place to put their guests who were starting to show up from New York City to stay at these states at their friends' houses long before many of these estates were actually even finished. Now, you can probably remember today, this house still exists, this portion of it, and I believe it's been moved. There's only here I know who's familiar with the property who can probably tell for sure. Um, this part of the house was eventually torn down. This still remains, and you can sort of still see a, a Somewhat of a, a chalet influence on the roofs, but also very much like a Queen Anne style, sort of East Lake detailing, and the stick style, and that sort of thing. Um, and the old train used to come right behind it, right to the village green. So guests could sort of get right off the train and stay right here at the, at the inn. <coughs> but it turns out that the uh, Modest confines of the Milbrook Inn were not sufficient enough 
to sort of uh, put up accommodations for all the people that were suddenly coming here to enjoy these estates. And so we have Halcyon Hall, Milbert's classic, one of Ware's classic buildings. Uh, from 1892, a year or two after the Milbert Inn was built. And you can see here also architecturally, you have the, uh, it, it's a classic Queen Anne English to be sure, but there are other, other aspects to it. You have some of the Flemish gables there, you have some of the French Norman tower, and it combines different aspects of English architecture, the half timbering and dormers and whatnot. Um, just a beautiful building. I think uh, this building could probably have an entire book written about just it by itself, probably. But we're going to do one book at a time. We'll see. What <laughs> but again, you can see years later when, the, when it became a college, they added uh, an elevator here. They closed all these spaces off to reclaim indoor spaces for uh, you know, academic use and for dormitory use and that sort of thing. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, the loss or the impending loss of Halcyon Hall is sort of a second act. It was abandoned in, I believe, 1905 and almost ready to be sort of demolished, destroyed, until Mayfriend Bennett came along and turned it into Bennett College. So in many ways, Bennett College is what gave this building a second life. So in many ways, it was almost never supposed to have lasted as long as it did. Um, so again, it gave it another 100 years. And again, this is sort of the, uh, the, the kind of thing you could probably have a book entirely just about House and Hall alone in the history. And then we move on to uh, Charles Dietrich, who was another client. Now, all these men, Wing, Dietrich, Davison, and others, they were all in business in New York together. They were all in chemical brokerage and pharmaceuticals. And in many ways, people assume that uh, Ware and Davison's connection is what brought Dietrich here, but it's a little more complicated than that. Charles Dietrich was a German chemist who came to this country penniless, but he was considered a genius. And Davison, of Altamont fame, recognized his genius and employed him as his, um, as his chemist. And they eventually um, went into business together, and he eventually founded the company Union Carbide. Uh, he was best known for the use of settling gas for lighting, which he used to light all the houses throughout the village. And this is a beautiful building. New York Times called it, credibly, the uh, most magnificent example of a building of its type in America. Just pictorially stunning, the German Renaissance, the stonework's amazing. You have stonework here that sort of suggests elements that are more usually carved, and just expert craftsmen. The uh, contractors for most of Ware's work in Milwaukee and elsewhere was a company called Meaden Taft from Cornwall, New York, and they were architects in their own right. But in a lot of cases, they employed the uh, Italian stonemason who came, stonemasons who came to Millbrook, worked on the estates and Halcyon Hall and the stonework that we see today. And a lot of them um, stayed, formed businesses of their own, families of their own. And in some cases, uh, in the cases of the Safaris, they actually became sort of builders and architects in their own right. So a lot of the buildings you see in Milbrook that are mostly stone-based, some of them look like they're aware, but they're actually a Safari. So he kind of inspired uh, his followers to kind of build in the same tradition that he had. Ah, there we go. So this is sort of a collage view of Deheim, which in German means the home. There's the initial mansion that he built in 1889. It was originally a, uh, a colonial house on a farm, and he expanded it with towers, etc. You have his another chalet here, Swiss bowling alleys that he built, carriage houses. And this house and this house are the same view from either side. This was his ten tennis lodge. He had a, a tennis court <coughs> right here, right in front of the mansion, which was sort of an architectural faux pas that the architect tried to insist against, but Dietrich insisted that he wanted his tennis courts in his house. He was fanatical about the sport of tennis, and I lived uh, to be in his 90s, they say. Perhaps uh, this is the reason why. And again, you sort of see the wonderful work, stonework, that kind of implies things that are more usually carved in stone, used through rough, rough field stone. Dietrich and Ware, through the years, talk continuously about building a castle. The mansion, etc., were all supposed to be temporary until he devised this wonderful castle that they talked about doing. And years and years went by, and eventually, he just, in 1907, he built this barn, which was supposed to be the small ramparts of the castle that was supposed to tower over it, um, and he decided just to make it a cow barn instead. There's been much talk through the years about why Dietrich abandoned his plans, um, 
And it could just be that he realized finally that he already had a day hunt, already everything that he really wanted. And being a practical man, he decided to go ahead and just make it a cow barn for his growing uh, cow enterprise. And if you see the sort of cathedralist proportions of, of the farms up at, at the uh, Hitchcock estate, you say to yourself, if that was just the ramparts of the castle, his intention for a castle must have been truly grand indeed. <laughs> it's more likely that their idea for a castle was probably their way of brainstorming a lot of the architecture that did end up appearing throughout the estate. Uh, oh boy, we got new problems. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at what, Dietrich's? Uh, let's go to um, Dietrich's Mill, yes. This is from, um, I believe, 1890. There had been a mill there um, for years before that, but obviously quite smaller. I've been told it is the tallest building in Millbrook. If you connect, <laughs> if you count all the stories that go below ground level all the way down to where the dam goes underneath. I believe it's seven or eight stories. And again, you can see sort of like the chalet kind of style roofing. And uh, a lot of Ware's houses have the, the signature sort of shingle style that you sort of see, sort of colonial. To some extent, even his most Queen Anne houses had some aspect of the colonial and some aspect of the shingle style. And Dietrich had businesses throughout the village that he uh, invested in, contributed to, do, started, etc. And most of these businesses were intended to sort of subsidized the um, staggering operational cost of building and maintaining his estate. So within a couple of years of this uh, showing up in Milbert, he almost took over Dietrich. He was building everything, he was investing in businesses, contributing businesses, and um, I don't know if they quite knew how much that their uh, German friend would sort of come to dominate their aunt's life, but uh, it turns out that he was probably the most um, ardent client of Ware's in Milburn. It's said that their relationship resembled the most uh, that of an um, artist and patron, such as in the in Renaissance. I believe most of the mills have been turned into uh, private housing, although I'm not certain. There was talk back in the 70s of turning into a restaurant. I don't know if that happened. <laughs> Sorry for the te technical glitch. It could very well be my fault. I'm not so good at uh, burning this. For This is the Milbert Gas and Electric Works, which actually was located right where this church is. And it was built between 1894 and 1898. And this was where's, uh, in the world's very first small-scale acetylene gas plant. And it was built as sort of a boutique model to sort of demonstrate to the world what could be done on a small scale with that industry. And, um, he put his estate as superintendent, a man named James H. Murphy, in charge. And, uh, oh, there's the roof. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he bought sufficiently of, of the enterprise to put his estate uh, uh, superintendent in charge of it. And Murphy was a man who had uh, a lot of experience running large-scale ranching operations. And the building, if it pops up, has sort of a pioneer, sort of western flavor to it. Not at all like the sort of overly decorated, over-exuberant houses that you see in the estates. It was more sort of a very utilitarian type building. Uh, but he still put a few touches of whimsy to sort of let you know that it was aware. And I believe there was an explosion at some point in which Murphy almost lost his life. And then by about 1920 or so, they closed down the gas plant. Uh, you know, in the ubiquity of electricity had sort of taken over by then and sort of made it obsolete within just a couple of decades. So it was sort of a uh, nostalgic view of the old uh, gaslight age that was sort of almost instantly sort of uh, out of date. Well, we saw the roof anyway. <laughs> Interestingly enough, if we do see in the photo comes up, um, 
to the right of the gas plant is the old blacksmith shop for the school, which was designed by um, where's nemesis, William J. Beardsley. Beardsley is an architect from Poughkeepsie. He lived in Millbrook, but um, Beardsley and the Wares had sort of a feud. There was sort of a there was sort of bad blood there. Clashes, as it were. And uh, the two architects never got along. I like to say in my book, when you see the two buildings side by side, the gas plant and the, the uh, blacksmith shop, I like to say that the buildings both survive and they get along in a way that their architects never did. <laughs> I see. Well, if not, if you want to go past it, we can go past it. Yeah, we get optimistic. Yeah, it's gonna suddenly fix this. Thank you for your patience on the technical glitches here, because again, it's not something that uh, a lot of the images I'm using are not ones from the book; they're just ones for presentation purposes that I put together specifically for this. Try to move ahead even to the next one if possible if, if the gas plant doesn't come up. That would be the Dayhun bowling alleys. And this is again the sort of um, one of the culminations of Ware's work in the chalet style. This is um, very much influenced by German and Swiss architecture. You see the stones on the roof, giant boulders that were not there for fear of actual avalanche, they were more just sort of architectural affectation. Basically, this was his sort of a German beer hall, bowling alley, billiard hall, sort of a 19th century of a deluxe version of a deluxe man cave. Basically. <laughs> on the chimney, it looks like SL. Oh, no, that could just be a, oh, I see what you mean there. Yeah, I don't think so. It's just sort of a, a image in the stonework. It has an identical chimney to his little tennis hut. And again, this is sort of the, the ultimate Swiss chalet, an ideal he'd been working towards for over 10 years or so. This building survives and has been restored completely without the stones on the roof. Though. They decided to go a bit too far, as it were. Um, and I believe it was uh, Smithsonian people who were involved in the restoration. And so it really, really has been life. John Foreman, who lived in the mansion, sort of reawakened a, a sense of stewardship for the whole estate on the parts of the owner. And so you sort of see that these buildings now are really sort of shining brightly. They, for years and years, they've seen very, very hard use, and, and some of them were not uh, projected to, to even survive. So it's good to see that there is some, some sense of stewardship still for these wonderful buildings. I try the gas plant again, you never know. Probably that part of the CD is yeah, it's probably yeah. Uh, so we can just go to the next one here. This is actually not a a Milbrook house, but I included it just to show where it's influence of the chalet style on other buildings. This is the would be the parliament of the Mohawk Mountain House in nearby New Paltz, and is also sort of the ultimate Swiss chalet. Again, an idea that he's been working for for years and years and years. Uh, Where designed most of the mountain house. Uh, in various styles. And in many ways, Mohonky is sort of his most encyclopedic building. It includes elements from his warehouses, um, aspects of chalet style, other aspects of buildings that he designed in Millwork and in Europe and elsewhere. So it's sort of like an encyclopedia of all of the, of Ware's work. Well, while we're waiting for this one to come up, I can point out here on this, oops, there we go. This there, uh, on this building here, is a blueprint of a house that was never really built. You can see very much the resemblance to his work at Halcyon Hall and Dietrich and Mohawk. And it sort of became sort of a signature style that he would work towards. Uh, 
What was this under here now? Uh, I believe probably, I don't really know. Um, let's try file folder, maybe the first one. Where are you looking? Oh, right up there. Okay. I think that was it. I think that's how we started. Mm -hmm. No, that wouldn't be it. That wouldn't be it. Mm -hmm. Maybe the second one. No, not it. Do you remember where this was? No. No. Uh, maybe the final one, perhaps? Again, my apologies for the technical glitch. Yeah. Be honest, I'm surprised as many of them showed up as they do. <laughs> Is that it? Probably the final one, application perhaps. I'm thinking. It seems to have the most. No? It says it's already ready. Patrick, you sure it's not the top one? I'm sorry? We heard the that. Top, it might be. It could the top be. one? It could be. I'll mean, just go ahead and try. Well, they're going to his license. Now, let's maybe just click on it and see what happens, I suppose. Oh, no. Yeah. We'll get back to where they're looking for. Again, my apologies on the technical glitch here. Um, Did we get back to pick? Was it through pictures, perhaps? Yeah, I think it's no. that saved on the hard drive. Okay. I think it's on. Here we go. All right. No, we found our way back. Where were we? Mohonk. We're we're right right way. Way. Uh, so we'll go now to the Mohonk. Uh, yeah, Mohonk. Let's take a look at the Mohonk parlor wing. You can see the, the chalet style. Again, very similar to Milbert, very similar to Aspect of Housing Hall similar to Dietrich Chalet. Um, this was built in 1900, and this metal um, sort of underpinning there is the only real appearance of anything really sort of modern, unapologetically, in Ware's work almost anywhere. The rest of it is pretty much sort of a wonderful confection from the Victorian age. He also designed the stone building as well. You can sort of see executed in stone, the Flemish gable that would you see in small miniature that used to appear on Halcyon Hall. So again, you see this building becomes sort of an encyclopedic version of, uh, of Ware's work. It was built by Quakers, Smiley family, and um, it's possible that Ware was contracted by the Smiley family through the wings in Milbrook, who were also Quakers. And so there's sort of a, sort of a family connection there. Um, as I'm writing my book, I'm trying to figure out how does you get from one client to another to another. You can sort of see a chain and spread through all of the various clients. Yeah. And the next one I'm including, also from Mohonk, would be the Mohonk Gatehouse. Oh, yeah. Just past uh, the village of New Paltz. Yeah. Executed in stone. Yeah. And so you see sort of the similarities to the Milbert Gatehouse, although more of a tower, and no portcullis. This is more of a Moorish kind of entry. More inviting rather than protective. Um, and this building is from 1907 and is currently being restored. It is no longer the entrance to the mountain house. You have to drive all the way around and up. But um, they didn't allow cars on the property until I believe the 1950s or 1960s. You would show up in your car, stay here, and then they'd take you in carriage all the way up to the house. Sort of keep this sort of Victorian flavor going as long as they could. They also didn't allow card playing, dancing, or drinking. Uh, the drinking, I think, is allowed now. They probably have a limit, one or two drinks, that's about it. If anyone has a chance ever to go to New Paltz, New Paltz to the Mohawk Mountain House, just a wonderful stay, wonderful just for the afternoon, uh, just a fantastic place. And I include one more here that is in Plainfield, New Jersey. The reason I include it is to show the similarity to the Dietrich Gate House. Oh, yeah. This was built much later. This was probably about, oh, 1911, 1912 or so. 
And so it was already sort of out of date even as soon as it appeared. It was already sort of uh, wildly kind of out of style. You can see almost identical stonework to the Dietrich estate. Unfortunately, um, this house survives, but everything around it has all been pretty much, these are all suburban houses around it now, so sort of unrecognizable. But at least the building itself still, still, still survives. So you can see uh, his, his impact of work on Melbourne had on work that he would do in other places. It's actually uh, likely that he wanted this gatehouse design specifically having seen Dietrich's gatehouse. Uh, the client was uh, Hyde, a gentleman named Hyde, who owned the majority of North Plainfield. And so now we'll go back into uh, more Milbrook houses. This is on Maple Avenue. Uh, the late John Foreman one wrote a very wonderful history of this house. Um, and again, a little bit different for where you have sort of a, instead of the English, you have sort of a French Norman tower. And wonderful shingling, little details. A little different from his traditional Queen Anne's. You can see him sort of changing stylistically. I believe this is from about 1896 or so. <laughs> it worked once. Yeah. It worked one time. Why not? Right? Try it again. I don't know what the flag is. Oh, yeah, that's what broke down. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, this is one of the wonderful Milwork houses. I actually have two photos of this one because it uh, shows so much uh, where it's typical Queen Anne meetings. Another way, maybe? It's not going to let me close it. Oh, jeez. So... Oh, dear. Oh, well, well, let's see. Well, while we're waiting for this, I'd like to mention um, John Foreman's book, um, Houses in Milburn. Very wonderful. If no one's read it, it's really because you to take a look at it. Really fantastic treatment he did. Um, John did a book about houses in Millbrook, some of which include where. I'm doing a book on where, which includes some houses in Millbrook. So there's a little bit of overlap. But he did really wonderful work exploring the history of many of these houses, as well as preserving the Dayheim mansion itself. Well, if you want to go to the next one, <laughs> maybe. There's a second one of this house, maybe that one. No, maybe it has something to do with the size of the files. They're all very, mm -hmm. very different. Like, these are bigger files. Mm -hmm. It could be. It could very well be. Yeah, yeah possibly. The gas by is 10,151 kilowatts. Oh, my lord. Mm -hmm. Is that a lot? I'm not very good at technology. Well, I mean, this one is 1,700, <laughs> so proportionately. Mm -hmm. We well, can maybe even go to the second one, maybe. Perhaps that can come up. Hopefully. <laughs> well, again, this house is on the corner of uh, Reservoir Drive and Church Street. A twin-towered house. One has a very spiral roof. Really wonderful, wonderful house. It sort of telegraphed all the architectural vocabulary and vernacular that would wear, would use throughout Milburn. Um, and sort of emblematic of most of his work here. I was told growing up that the house was haunted, but I'd say they're probably all haunted. <laughs> well, anyway, if you feel like moving on to one of the next ones, whatever things might come up. Oh, dear. <laughs> the next one's pretty big files, <laughs> We can go to the Friendly Lane House. Let's see how this one come up. Again, it seems the ones that probably have the most uh, kilobytes might take the longest to come up. Ironically, they're the worst photographs of all, so I don't know why this one could look.
okay, this is a house behind the library. This is a side view. Um, and this was built in 1891 for the uh, very first president of the Bank of Milburn, a gentleman named John J. Donaldson. And uh, you can see here the typical preponderance of towers and dormers and sort of uh, cheerful little roofs and shingling, etc. This house originally, it's very difficult to actually get a photograph from the front of the house because it's covered with trees, etc. This house originally had a big tower in the front of it that at some point was removed. It happened to quite a few here warehouses in Millbrook that the Victorian roofs were simplified and removed, probably due to the high maintenance nature of most aging Victorian roofs. In other words, leaks. So the roofers probably said, why don't you just flatten this and get rid of it? And people probably just went along with it. But it's wonderful that so many of these still have these sort of wonderful pinnacles and towers. Not a very good photo, but you can tell what the building is. This is the Milbert Clubhouse on Front Street. And uh, built as a club, private club for most of the landed gentlemen in this area. It's a remarkably simple production for a wear. The balustrade used to be a bit more complex, but in general you can see, um, as the 1900s began, the architect slowly began simplifying his style and just sort of, not including so much of the sort of over-the-top architectural pyrotechnics that you see in his estate work. But you can still see sort of uh, pedimented gables and little windows and that sort of thing. Stained glass here. Like most of these houses as we move into the 20th century, a lot of the sort of architectural wonder is on the inside. This has really, really wonderful staircase and stair hall inside. So you see this sort of exclamatory architectural features on the interior now, rather than sort of being proclaimed on the outside of the building. I'll just add quickly, in the fall sure. we had a, a walking tour looking at a few different buildings in Millbrook, and this was one of the ones that was on it. So, oh, wonderful. So people who took part in that got to see the inside. And see the interiors. Yeah, yeah the staircases are just wonderful. A lot of East Lake uh, turned balustrades and things like that. Just a beautiful building. Uh, the next one is the St. Joseph's Parish Hall, uh, which was partially a gift from Charles Dietrich to his new parish. It appeared in 1890, not long after he appeared, but I've heard some info this evening that may sort of um, conflict with that. A lot of these buildings are sort of hard to attribute. I've tried to be very conservative in attributing um, the building to where he did have competitors in this town, such as Beardley, and there's other just sort of uh, generic houses. So I've tried to really err on the side of caution of attributing a house to where uh, definitively. Uh, there's many houses throughout the Millbrook that probably are by him that I'm just not certain of, that we don't really know for sure. But again, sort of a simplified version of the church itself, sort of in three-fifths miniature. And in many ways, it looks like as if it's older than the church, but it's done in a sort of a purposefully sort of backdated retro style so as not to compete. But you can see sort of a gable-hipped roof and a little tower, little triangle dormer windows there. It has a fair amount of charm to it, but not at all enough to compete with the actual church itself. Patrick, you said that was built before or after the church itself? Uh, built after the church. Uh, the parish hall is 1890. I believe the St. Joseph Church was um, 1872, I want to say. I'm not certain specifically. This is uh, Franklin Avenue. Uh, just one of many stores that he designed. The building right next to it is also aware. And again, you can kind of see the sort of simplified uh, approach that he began taking, more of a colonial shingle style. But you still have the diamond uh, pane. Shingles, wonderful little balconies, sort of curved eyelet windows, etc. Um, so a lot of these buildings, uh, the houses specifically, obviously these state houses were commissioned by specific um, individuals. A lot of the houses and residences were, uh, if not for specific individuals, they were spec houses that they were just built and then someone would come along and buy them. In many cases, and even the store is the same, the same kind of thing. And we have here more uh, residences on Franklin Avenue. Um, the one here is from 1909. Definitely aware. This is, I'm fairly certain it's a James Ware. The middle one, possibly. I'm not certain yet. I haven't uh, confirmed one way or the other. But you sort of see, uh, again, a sort of simplified approach. But uh, beautiful houses, you know, no two exactly alike. They sort of 
contribute to sort of a variety of streetscape. And um, again, you see just more, a lot of colonial elements coming in, a lot more traditional sort of elements coming in in the new century. I think a lot of the architectural power techniques of the Queen Anne style were kind of considered sort of passe or maybe sort of garish and out of taste by the time the uh, turn of the century occurred. Again, not the greatest photo, but you can tell which house it is. This is on uh, Merritt and Front Street, I believe, the Moroan house. And just wonderful, wonderful house. Again, I believe this one was originally a colonial that was added onto by Ware. And so you can sort of see the similar sort of towers, wonderful sort of eyebrow dormer window. And sort of East Lake styling and woodwork on the porches. Another one of the great, wonderful, wonderful Miller houses. Most of these houses, as you can see, had a preponderance of turrets and, and uh, very exuberant roofs that became sort of a trademark for the wear. This is on Merritt Avenue, just, I believe, just down the street from here. Um, and again, a little more simplified, a little bit more of like standard sort of colonial, but again, there's always sort of a, a twist to it. So the, the porch turned sideways, diagonal, so the hip gabled roof, and the diamond pane window shingling, etc. This actually had a tower roof that went up this high, so a peak tower, and again, at some point, probably in the early 20th century, it was removed for whatever reason, more than likely a matter of leaks and or maintenance. Another house on Maple Avenue, very sort of boxy colonial. On first appearance, you wouldn't think of it as a wear. Basically sort of a standard box with a sort of center tower, as it were. But there are little elements, such as the pedimented gables, etc. But again, you see the architect slowly just trying to sort of genericize his buildings to sort of fit in with uh, the requirements of the early 20th century, sort of not so exuberant. This house features the, uh, in front, the uh, porte cochere, which is sort of a fancy French word for carport. And, uh, Sort of odd that he would make that the uh, central feature of the house, but I think in keeping the variety going, it's just a matter of uh, just trying different things. These are all in no particular order. We're sort of skipping around in, in dates and, and times. <coughs> this is on Elm Drive. This is from uh, 1898. <coughs> Fairly old photograph, not such a great photo, but you can sort of see it. It's actually been refinished and painted very beautifully. It really stands out now. Uh, but again, this is sort of just almost like a standard colonial, really. But you see sort of elements such as the uh, leaded glass, stained glass, the sort of towered pinnacle roof. And um, again, sort of just fitting in, not being so sort of exuberant with the Queen Anne, more just kind of uh, a little more generic, a little more traditional, a little more conservative. This is another very standard, very straightforward house. Quite simple, really. At first glance, you wouldn't really associate it with a lot of where it's working over. But again, you can see the sort of central tower against a sort of you know standard boxy kind of colonial. Wonderful little features, though, such as the uh, ionic capitals there. Little details that you sort of put in, mixing brick, stone, wood. Again, a very simple production, not at all what you think of as a, a standard wear, but you see as it goes into the 20th century, then it kind of begins to simplify. It's on the corner of Church Street and Alden Place. A lot of the houses in Alden Place, again, very simple, but were warehouses. Again, this looks like just a standard colonial, but if you sort of diagonally turn the porch a little bit, it sort of gives it a little bit more of a, you know, just sort of artistic, picturesque sort of flavor. You can see here the sort of very beautifully carved sort of brackets and things. But again, a very, very simple production. Now as we move into the uh, 
1909, 1910, that <coughs> you see where I move away almost entirely from the Queen Anne style to what is called the arts and crafts style, which is uh, something that originated in California, much more simple, um, a sense of uh, letting materials speak for themselves, stone, stucco, cement, etc. In this particular one, you just see sort of the eyebrow dormer, and that's about it, the only real architectural feature. You see the one entrance just slightly larger than the left one, just to sort of relieve the monotony. Um, this was a gift of the Wing family to the church's parish. Where didn't design the church, it may have just been simply a matter of uh, unavailability at the time the church was designed. He was very, very busy. Um, but in many cases, it was just a matter of uh, the estate owners hiring another architect just to sort of spread the wealth as it were, to sort of kind of knock all, all their eggs into the one basket as it were. This building still survives. Um, I believe there's a bowling alley in this building too. I could be wrong. Yes. Was originally. It and was. probably not anymore? No. Oh, okay, yeah. But they've redone the upstairs and it's really nice. Oh, okay. It's a beautiful building. Yeah, but again, a very simple, very simple, unadorned production for a wear. So you see himself give himself almost over entirely to the arts and crafts style by, by about 1909, 1910. Again, this one is another uh, arts and crafts wonder. The original firehouse to Melbourne. And this was uh, largely a gift of the Thorne family, and ironically the very first fire they were called upon to put out was at the Thorne estate. <laughs> so maybe he had sort of a premonition. Again, you can sort of see the uh, shingle style, pointed roofs, etc. But again, quite a simple production. Uh, if I'm not mistaken now, it's the headquarters for um, an architectural firm. Right. Mm -hmm. Lodi? Oh, yeah. Lodi. yeah. So that's sort of appropriate, all these years later. And this one is uh, not the greatest photo, so it's a little hard to sort of see exactly where it is. This is on Upper Maple Avenue. It's a house called Twin Maples. I always like when a house actually has a name, because you say, wow, this place must be really important. Right? Um, but again, you can see the arts and crafts influence with the wide ease and the sort of tower cupola stonework. This is actually, I believe, from the side view or the side yard. It's hard to say. Again, it was another one that's very hard to photograph. Um, but again, you see the arts and crafts influence, and the interiors of this building are just fantastic. A lot of built-in benches and built-in beds and things like that, built-in closet work and things. And uh, again, as Ware kind of gives himself over to the arts and crafts, his own sort of expression kind of dissipates and becomes a little bit more generic. But I guess it's just sort of the, uh, you know, the maturity of the architect in a town that he had already displayed so many wonderful architectural Queen Anne, Victorian, higher techniques, and where he would have surely been forgiven for more, he decided to instead to show some restraint and spare the town a sort of overload of too much, uh, what they would call dollhouse diorama in Victoriana. So, again, you see him kind of just changing the pace with the times. And this is a wonderful building. Uh, this is again the sort of arts and crafts style, but also combined a bit with the chalet style as well. You can see the similarities between this building and the uh, St. Lawrence house there that I have. The arrangement of stone and um, eaves and overhangs and whatnot. And again, you can sort of see that this is, it's aware, but it's also kind of incorporating more generic styles. By about 1910, 1920, you had what they called the pattern books, where people could go and you just buy a book that has 100 plans in it for your house, and you could sort of make that and customize it to your own. Extent. So it looks a bit more generic compared to most yeah. wares, but again, you see sort of a, the development from uh, 1800 right through. Uh, I believe this building, I believe, is 1914 or 1913. It's on Maple. I'm sorry. It's on Maple. It's on Maple. Yeah, just above where the band shell is, probably on your left. Um, if I'm not mistaken, they've closed off Maple Avenue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you'd have to drive all the way around. What, wasn't that delivered by rail? That house, it was oh, it, one of the prefab houses that was delivered by me. It, a wing, that was a wing residence. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Yeah, it's, it's very possible. It's very, very possible. Again, it looks a little bit more generic than, than your usual sort of yes. James Ware, as it were. But by that point, again, Ware was sort of 
involved in sort of doing more generic type designs, doing the, pattern, book, pattern book designs and things like that. And they used to call it the prairie style, I Really? Think. Oh yes, there's elements of the prairie style. Yeah. yeah. I guess uh, a lot of these terms are sort of uh, loose at best. Sure. Arts and crafts, prairie style, etc. Mm -hmm. But you do sort of see a uh, sort of horizontal, horizontality about it, that you don't see the sort of upward movement, you see more of a horizontal kind of development. Um, Almost like a bungalow style, even though it's two stories. Does that overhang eliminate gutters? Um, well, I'm not certain. I'm not certain. What, what? They probably was intended to back then. I would imagine now people probably feel maybe that's not the case. <laughs> They've had probably installed their own, as it were. Yeah. But, uh, we have the present day owner right here. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. So yeah. I believe from 1913, I believe your house was from. I believe. Wonderful, wonderful house. Yeah, the very side proud. Porch is a now. Oh wow! Yeah, just beautiful, just beautiful. And again, on uh, Maple Avenue, you would see that he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't put three or four houses in the same style together. He would sort of vary it up to kind of give a, a little bit of variety to the streetscapes. We're coming up to the end here of, of where's Millbrook houses here. <coughs> this next one is from uh, 1914. This is the very last residence that James Ware designed. He'd been uh, retired effectively since about 1909 or so, and his sons pretty much took over the firm. But any house that was actually designed in Millwork still came from the drawing board of the senior partner, yeah. where it was still sort of very much, uh, uh, very much a thrall to Millwork, you know. Um, and this being his final house, was designed as a, I believe, dormitory for the girls at Bennett College, and eventually later became the president's house. But uh, you look at this and you sort of, you don't really think James Ware. You don't think the traditional sort of Ware. It's a, sort of a standard five-day colonial. Um, but there are touches, a sort of a Grecian balustrade and uh, wonderful tall chimneys, really tall dormers. Inside, this house has, I believe, ten federal-style fireplaces. Some of them go all the way from floor to ceiling. Just a really, really wonderful house. One of the truly great, wonderful yeah. new houses. <laughs> And we come up to now, which is um, not only Ware's final building in Millbrook, but his very final building of all. Oh, the uh, original y YMCA, um, largely a gift of the Thorne family, uh, built in 1914. And in Ware's case, um, it's more sort of a final parting gift to a village that had uh, inspired so much of his sort of architectural inspiration. It looks a little different today. Not much has changed. It's a remarkably simple production for a wear. You see sort of a Mediterranean influence with the uh, roof. But we see wonderful uh, things you don't see now, which is sort of the indented oval there with the uh, embossed urns. And you have this entrance here, which looks almost like as if it could appear on a, a New York City uh, police precinct house. As it, <laughs> it looks sort of tacked on, as it were. It may or may not be original to the wear. I'm not really certain. Um, but again, you see the sort of traditional thing, the sort of rounded windows, Romanesque style, very sort of Italian it. And again, the sort of uh, the final culmination. As a, if Ware's uh, life were a play, this would be sort of a very dashing final act, I'd say. May I make a comment in that Certainly. regard? Certainly, please. Uh, during, the, during the energy crunch, there was a big play to put clabber, to insulate the, the stucco, uh -huh. put clabbers on the outside, and to reduce the size of those windows in the doorway. The inside was altered quite a lot because of the energy crunch. But there were there was a play, a move to put to do the, to make those changes on the exterior. Uh -huh. And I think we wrote some very, very torrid letters. <laughs> you know, that's what it takes sometimes, I believe, you know, for people to say, No, we like our building the way it is. We like our village the way it is, as it were. Well, it looks like they probably succeed in getting rid of uh, that initial front doorway anyway. At least they said, okay, that's probably enough, right? And then the final image I figured I'd end with is, uh, again, one of these sort of uh, most beloved little, tiny little buildings here in Milbrook, which is the uh, gazebo on the Y field, if it comes up. There we go. Yes. There we go. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is on the uh, yeah, the old drive. YMCA field. I call it the Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's it's a bit of a mystery where this one comes from. I don't know if it was originally put there in place or if it came from one of the other estates. It's possible that the house that's right about here, about 1890 or so, you have these sort of terraces. It's possible it may have been part of the garden there, but I'm not really sure. I'm not really mm. sure about that. But I figured I'd end on this one because it's one of the more beloved houses. Uh, well, I love the little buildings in Melbourne that everyone sort of knows. You can sort of see the uh, great almost equestrian style uh, woodwork there, almost identical to the gates at Edgewood, the Flagler estate. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the gates are the only thing that survives from the Flagler estate. I can never get a photo of it because the gates are never closed, so it's hard to actually see the way it actually looked. But uh, it's sort of uh, reminiscent of that in flavor. Um, but again, that's my presentation. I thank you all very, very much.